been renovating a house recently, and this man has some very tough questions to answer, let me tell you, because I got inspired by one of them TV programs. Well, that TV program was, in fact, Channel 4's Grand Designs, and this man has been presenting it for well over 20 years now. So, a big, warm Summer Jaguar Festival welcome, please, to Kevin McLeod. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now then. Is this just a quick Q&A on <laughs> DIY tips? Is that all it is? <laughs> well, I will start with the TV program, and we are going to get onto your amazing car, because you have come in an amazing icon of Jaguar's history, and a lot of people might not realise certain bits about your car that are interesting. But let's start with the last series of Grand Designs. It must have been a strange one for you, because there you were in the middle of the pandemic, still watching people build houses. Some of them started before it all kicked off with no idea what was going to befall their project. Yeah. Some of the projects we filmed had been going for like four years and we're just on the cusp of being finished, so that was good. Some had started in the pandemic and because they'd started early, that was fine. We're now due to deliver another series in September and these are projects which have been running over the last year and a half in a period in which we've had the perfect storm of COVID, Brexit, um, and the supply chains across Europe just kind of evaporating, which means now that we have something like 23 projects on the go, none of which will ever, ever finish. <laughs> and all we're gonna do now for the next 15 years, I think, is just go back and see the same projects sort of slowly inch forward. You know, because things like steel, I mean, steel has doubled in price since May, so that's two months. And, and concrete suppliers are now saying to their customers, well, we can deliver in three weeks, we think, but we're not going to commit to a price till the week before. And if you want four by two timber, you can now buy it, but a month ago you couldn't. There was none in the country. Even sterling board, which is the cheapest, crappiest product you can buy, you know, oriented strand board, you know, the thing, that orange chip board, yeah? there's a kind of global shortage. Because there's, like most of the factories in Sweden have stopped production, there's one facility in Scotland making it. And they're so over, they're so overworked, they can charge whatever they like for it. So it's now going, it's now going for, for the price of mahogany veneer, you know. I mean, most of those projects in good times often started on rocky ground, didn't they? And it's interesting to see you give some of those people a real hard time sometimes on projects that, I suppose naivety is the word that they often approach them. And have you, have you seen that over the years? Do you pick people like that on purpose to think, well, this might go wrong for a sense of jeopardy? <laughs> you see, you call it naivety. I just call it human nature, because we, we all are driven by hope and optimism. And if we weren't, we'd slid our wrists or we'd, you know, we'd go and live in a cave like hermits. It, it's hope and optimism which drives us forward. Hope is the great human uh, driving force which takes us to the edge of the cliff and then very quietly and gently just pushes us off, you know? Anyway, rocky ground is a brilliant place to build a house. What are you talking about? <laughs> Well, that's it. One of the places, of course, uh, that you visited in the last series was in the Fens, which is far from rocky, very wet, in fact. And there was an, adva an example of a young couple uh, coming into property ownership together for the first time. Uh, one of the others that really stood out in the last series was the young couple that had struggled with cancer, the pair of them. And despite physical weakness, the pandemic, and the fact that they were more vulnerable than others, still soldiered on and made that barn into a house. They did, Greg, Greg and Georgie, yeah. And the other couple were in Fens. That, that was an amazing story about family, because he was not only building a house for himself, but also for his mother, who was in a, in a caravan in a caravan park, and her partner. And uh, so it was all about you know family connections and, and creating that safe haven to be in. Uh, Greg and George's story was amazing because they, they both battled cancer and she was still on a lot of therapy and, and, and yet she was d driving the dumper while he was driving the digger um, and then going off for her treatment the next day. So it was a real, a real story of how, you know, inspiring. Not just how hope and optimism drives people but actually how that positive energy that human, humans have can infect others. It's a real, you know, for me that's what Grand Designs is about. After the first series, I had a great producer, a great friend of mine, John Silver, and we used to go and we used to do stuff like this on stage at design events, and um, and we'd be asked, you know, what makes it tick? And I would say, ha, 
it's all about the architecture. It's architecture and design. And John would say, no, 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 it's people. These are people stories about humans, the human narrative, and the forces that make us positive creatures, you know. Anyway, after about two years of this, I found myself on stage answering the same question, but saying, it's the people, it's the people. And John was saying, no, no, it's the architecture. It's the same with cars though, isn't it? You know, we do love to look at cars. We appreciate how they're built. We appreciate their beauty. But actually, especially when I'm interviewing people like yourself and others that we'll have on the stage throughout today, people who I interview on the Jaguar Enthusiast Club podcast, what makes a car come alive is when it interacts with people and memories are made within it. It's the same as buildings in that sense. It is, absolutely. And I draw a lot of analogies with cars and I would do far many more pieces to camera with cars, if they allowed me to talk. I have to resort to using food often instead. But the, the, the point about the car is it's just a lump of metal, yeah? And the experience of driving it is the experience of driving it. And you could sort of get in one and it's the same as in another, maybe. Look, there are 682 E-types over there, yeah? And I, I'm, that, looks like, that looks like Jaguar's car pound in, in you know, in, in the 1971 fuel crisis. <laughs> um, were they still making them in 71? They were, weren't they? Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, not being able to shift them. But, the, um, but my point being is that, um, so I, I'm working on a car at the moment, which is not a Jaguar, therefore I am bound contractually to not mention its name. But I'm working on a car, actually there's a pair of cars, and I'm trying to get them up together. Right, and they're, they're not British. And the point being, I had to find somebody who could make tubular, oval tubular steel chassis members in high molybdenum steel. And I found this lady in Italy who is the granddaughter of the man who invented high molybdenum steel ovoid chassis components, um, a man called Gilberto Colombo. And anyway, so she said, yeah, we can sell it to you. We'll, we do a minimum run of 500 meters and it's going to cost you 17,000 pounds. And I said, but I only need like, you know, eight meters for the middle of the car. And, and she said, I tell you what, if you send me photographs of the chassis and of the car when you finished it, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just get the rollers out and we'll roll you up a special batch. And this was the managing director of a firm in the middle of Italy saying this. And I said, great. So we sort of entered into that informal contract and she rolled out the steel. And as a result, Serena Omodeo now owns 15% of that car. And you cannot ever remove her contribution to that car from the car. And, and my, my point is this, is that what makes these special is, is the history, is the narrative, is the input of Bernie or Mike or Ronald or whoever helped you fix the engine that day or, do you know what I mean? And, I kind of think what's most, in, almost for me, almost, m almost as important as the car for me, is to make, is to write up a story about it. Is to sort of, is to, is to make sure that that story continues to go with the car. It doesn't matter how lowly the car is, really. It's got, if it's been abroad, you want to write up that story. If it's, if it's had somebody as lovely as Serena Amadeo supplying you the steel, you know. By the way, I haven't sent her the photographs because this is the car still isn't finished. This is four years on, right? And that's part of the narrative. It's like one of the houses. We'll keep coming back to you in years to come to see how it's getting on. Exactly. But I can see the enthusiasm that you, that you talk with when you're talking about craftsmen and using materials there. And, and I think that comes from your past, actually, because tell us about your dad, because I have a feeling that the shadow he has cast over the rest of your life is what gives you that enthusiasm for innovation and materials and craftsmanship. Tell us his story. Well, my dad was a, an engineer. He was an electronics engineer. He went to work for English Electric, and then he went to work for British Aircraft Corporation, and they built satellites and rockets, and he ended up testing rockets and testing satellites and, and just devising ways of destruction testing them to the point where they would explode, you know, or break. Um, not always popular with his colleagues, but the point is that that, you know, that kind of, kind of military-grade testing approach um, you kind of helped drive us through the 50s and 60s and actually helped drive you know, kind of the British aerospace industry. So, you know, Rolls-Royce and Marconi and other great British companies involved in aerospace were, you know, Concorde was the result of, if you like that. And in fact, Dad worked for a bit on, on Concorde, on the test systems for that. So, um, yeah, and he got me into cars. And my Sunday mornings were spent uh, sitting in the Wolseley with 
you know, literally sitting for an hour doing nothing with his head under the bonnet, telling me to occasionally press one of three pedals. That's it. And, and that was Sunday mornings. And um, I, I make no apology for the fact that when I drive an old car, when I'm under the bonnet of an old car, I am with my dad. It's that simple. It connects me completely, purely, directly to him. So my next question would then obviously be, how did you end up in building design instead of being an engineer or a mechanic or something? I'm hopeless at engineering. I'm really crap. <laughs> I was an art historian, you know? I could write words and look at pictures and paint. And, um, and that, that's where my, you know, that's where my skill set sort of lay. And I wish in a way I had, my brothers are much more mechanically minded than I am. And I wish I had got more into it. And I, I, in a way, you know, the last 10 years of my life have been a frantic and rather futile attempt to try and improve my skill set. So I'm here today with um, Mike Mercer, who from Auto Classico in Bristol, a big jag business. And um, Mike, I, I daren't go anywhere now without Mike. I'm thinking of asking him to come and help me fix the dishwasher later. It's, you know, it, it's just... a support crew, basically. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, in life it's a good idea, isn't it? You know, to have a few people around you. And I think it's, it's, it's really helpful. Um, yeah, no, 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 I mean, we went on holiday uh, two years ago around Europe uh, as, a, as a family trip, and we took a few old bangers. Mike came with us. Well, wow, that's taking it to the extreme. You have to take your mechanic on holiday with you. <laughs> so, such is the confidence in your car. Uh, I don't think we can all do that. But um, well, take us to that point then, over 20 years ago, which must be an astonishing thing for you to think about, when this moment came when Grand Designs came knocking. How did that come about? Did you ever imagine it would turn into the sort of stalwart of British TV that it is now? Well, at the time, everybody was making makeover television, which is very easy to make because you have a fixed time and a fixed budget and you've got an outcome that you can guarantee. And Carol Smiley. Yeah, and you've got Carol Smiley. Well, you did, yeah, yeah. And Lawrence, who's never gone away, you know. And the point about that kind of approach is that it puts the television production company in charge. So you know you're going to get an outcome. Whereas with Grand Design, somebody somewhere forgot to read the back page of the proposal, which was that we don't know how long it's going to take to do. <laughs> yeah. And we don't know if it will ever be finished. And there are, of course, projects that we haven't completed, you know, or some which have taken six or eight years. And in a way, I find those projects the most gratifying because they, they're the ones where you see time really pass. You know, you see children grow up and people get older and, and people come to realize that the house they were building was a complete mistake because actually all the children have left. <laughs> yeah. um, so, or, or there's a huge staircase in it, and actually by the time they finish, they need a you know a standard stair lift instead. But the, the nobody would commission it now for that reason because it's it's a sort of it's an open-ended book, and and I kind of think I used to think that the reason why we're still going is that people still enjoy watching it, but I now realise it's because we've got this forward we've got this book of projects going forwards into time and it's like it's like a treadmill we can never get off now we can never complete them all yeah it is an amazing thing and i've worked in television spheres and i know what script writers have to do to get shows commissioned i'm looking at john lakey down there he's done this same job as well you know and to try and get go into a, a tv uh, station and get a show commission that has absolutely no end point oh and by the way we're going to be following stories that will only cover one episode over three or four years Logistically, how do you even manage to do that with film crews? How do you keep track of it all? Really, really slowly. <laughs> so I've tried doing television, like, you know, like, which is weekly. I've done live television and I've done stuff which is turned around in six months, you know, and it's incredibly stressful. And the lovely thing about Grand Designs is we work with the same, I've worked with one of the sound guys for 25 years, you know, and we're still going. And it's the same small crews, it's everybody's slow burn. We do stop for lunch, which in television is unheard of these days. And we, we, t we pace ourselves so as not to burn ourselves out. And, um, and we chew through directors, of course, you know. They come and go, we suck the maximum juice out of them, then spit them out. Um, so I do, in a leech-like way, tend to thrive off the energy of other people around me, you know. I have to, and after 20 years. But it, it's important to, 
it's important actually, seriously, to thrive off the energy of the projects because each one is different. And in a way, it's in selecting the projects and ensuring that we have that a different story to tell every time that we maintain the enthusiasm and the you know the the, the energy of the of the project and keep going because slow burn is hard in telly. Everybody does does short term stuff, you know. Do you ever look at a project and think actually that's going to be too easy for those guys? They'll they'll do it too easily. We won't bother filming it. Uh, or is there always a bit of jeopardy? And and also after twenty years, do you now sit there as a kind of experienced? person who's watched so many properties be developed and sit back and go, nah, you're not going to do it in that time. Do you, do you feel that kind of guidance that you're able to give people now? I say that in every film. <laughs> and I say, and nobody listens to me. And I'm usually proved right, and I go on and I, I learn and I you know, try and proffer advice, and still nobody listens because, because of that hope and because of that optimism, because we all think that when we're going to do it, it's going to be perfect, it's going to be great, you know. And I'm just a, a doom monger. And I'm, I'm just trying to help people. Um, very gently, you know. Um, what was the first half of the question? Well, uh, do, you, do you ever turn down a project because it looks too easy? Oh, well... Is that possible? Well, it, no, no project is too easy. I, we, I don't like to film checkbook architects, you know, where somebody says, oh, we're in a real hole. I need a hundred thousand pound more. I'll just write a check. Yeah. Um, th that's never exciting. But w what's exciting is when people say, "We've got no money, and we've got eight months or a year and a half, or whatever, and, and the kids are moving back home." <gasps> and um, th that's exciting because y it involves people figuring stuff out. You know, the best kind of design is stuff that has been carefully considered. It's it's usually quite cheap to do. When people are in a real hole and a pickle, then actually thinking their way out of that is always more interesting, isn't it, than, than just spending their way out of it. And so I think, um, yeah, th there's, no, there's no such thing as a dull project, just as there is no such thing as a dull human being. I mean, there are plenty of people who go on too long, <laughs> but there's no such thing as a dull human being. A very big question, I suppose, but one that they, people must ask themselves as they, they do these projects, why do people do it? What do you think? Why? We need, a, we need houses. We need places to live. And it was also one of the last big adventures we all think we can go on. Yeah. Why do people restore cars? Why do people take 10 years restoring a car? You know, I was hoping you were going to go down well, that line. Well, you know, <laughs> it's the garage. It's somewhere to escape. It's somewhere, you know, and I don't mean from you know, other people in your life, but I mean it's somewhere to, to imagine, to find... Yeah, look, we could drink ourselves stupid every night, couldn't we? You know, there, there are different ways of finding nirvana, of finding happiness, of finding the pleasure. And in doing stuff, of course, we all connect with that Maslow's idea of flow. You know, the idea that you, you know, you're, you're in a... Suddenly you look up and four hours have elapsed and you don't know where the time's gone. And it's because you're so engaged with the process. And that is the same with building. And it's an opportunity for expression and it's... For many people, of course, it's an opportunity to, to make something and to improve the quality of their lives and to provide for those who they love. So, I, you know, I, I think there are good, proper, genuine reasons. People also like to show off and people also like to build themselves monuments and those are silly reasons to build. Um, but I think the, the purest, most noble reasons are, are absolute, yeah, they're the most fascinating ones. Yeah. Exactly the same reasons why people restore cars and, yes. you know, spend so much time preserving uh, vehicles from history. And I suppose that leads me into my next question. I've seen you get very cross when people try and preserve buildings and don't do it right. Where's the line between, and this applies to cars as well, preserving something and changing it beyond recognition? Yeah, so I am a, I'm an ambassador for the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings, of which no doubt many of you are members. I, actually, any, if anybody is a member of the SBAB, if you could put your hand up, that would be so heartwarming. Uh, oh, we got one, uh, two, he's three. No, no, he's lying, he put two hands up. There's a, a gentleman at the back. That's the point, no one's heard of it. It's almost the oldest conservation body in the world. Uh, founded by William Morris in the 1870s. And, it's a, and it stands for so many good things, but it's essentially about 
helping us try and make sense of our past. And we don't do that if we fake history. And we don't do that if we cover it up and obliterate it. We, so I'm all about the narrative. I think you've got, we've established that, yeah? Um, the storytelling, the story in something, and its value, that's, that's where it's come from. That's where it lies. It's in the story. And it's the same with all of these. I can guarantee that every single one of those E-types over there, yes, they're all different colors, and they've all got different grills, and they're from different years and different bits of chrome on them. But fundamentally, what differentiates them is who's owned them, where they've been, what they've done. And, and what the drives have been like, who's restored them, you know, what's the story behind that? And that's when it starts to get interesting in my view. So if you, if you I, I'm not a fan of restoration of buildings or cars. I don't understand why I would want a car to look and feel as though it has just rolled off a production line in 1965. Now there are many people who like that, but I like a little bit of patina you know, I like a little bit of, uh, you know, I like, I'm more of the oily rag school. I'm very fussy about finish, and I do like a great paint finish, and I'm, you know, I love that ceramic thing they do now, and, you know, and I like well stored chrome and beautiful leather, and I restore my own leather, and I, you know, I am guilty sometimes of taking it a bit too far, you know, a bit too new. Um, so um, I, I can't, I sort of, I understand the addiction you know, the, the pull of the idea of making this as perfect as possible. But the danger is in doing that, we also lose the narrative, we lose the story. And I love coming across a car that's got beaten up old seats, you know, yeah. that just, that, and, it went, and a few stickers in the window that tells you that it did a rally in, in Belgium in 1973. And, and all of a sudden, it's magical. Every scuff, every cut, every mark has a story. I was there in such and such a year when yeah. that happened. In my case, they're usually when I reversed into something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, let's talk about your cars, because you're on this stage, not just because you are uh, a favorite to many through Grand Designs, but because you are, like us, infected with a terrible illness. And that is, you are a Jaguar fan. And it's, uh, once you've got it, you can't get rid of it. So firstly, run us through the fleet. <laughs> the fleet. So I own two rusting hulks, which one day will be, well, actually, I think they're probably going to have to turn into one glorious car in the end. You know, we have to raid one for the other. And I'm hoping that no, in, within five years, and I'm, I'm being optimistic here, that it might join, you know, this beautiful fleet here. Um, yeah, so that's, anyway, that's, that, that's hope and ambition embodied there, right? That, that cliff again. That cliff, <laughs> right? Um, and I've got, however, I've got two runners, and they're both here. And one is a, a 1976 Jag Coupe XJ6. And I have to say that in a bit of a kind of, you know, geezer, because it, yeah, yeah. it's a geezer car. <laughs> um, and that is, that's um, like most coupes, that's two, two tone, you know? It's, it's, it's metallic gray, and on the sills, rust. Vinyl roof? Vinyl roof, yeah, vinyl roof. Um, it had a paint job 10 years ago, previous only did that. But you've got to remember, this is a 76 car, therefore made from water-soluble steel. And, um, you know, you have, to, you have to repaint them regularly. And somebody said to me this morning, yeah, they rust from the inside out. And I thought, yeah, you're right, because the floor pan underneath the car looks really good, but underneath the mats, it's rusting inside the car. How is that? It's, of course, it's leaks, that's why. Um, so. It's a, it's a hilarious car, it's very beautiful. As Jay Leno said, it's the most beautiful car in the world when the, the windows are down. And I, what I can say is it's also, <coughs> when the windows are down, it could also be the wettest car in the world because <laughs> the relay's gone on the windows and you can't get them up again. So th that's, you know, um, a joy, but you know, it's work in progress as they all were then. And um, the other car is a, a real sweetheart of mine. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I'm getting emotional about it now. Um, it's a 1931 Swallows bodied Wolseley Hornet. The reason I bought it is because my dad had a Wolseley, it's the car I sat in. But what I didn't realize when I bought it is that Swallows, of course, became SS cars, and which became then Jaguar. And um, so I'd like to think it might be the earliest Jaguar here. It's in Wolseley engine and chassis, but it's got a Swallows body on it. Well, Wolseley is a name that goes back to the very, very early days, of course, of motoring in Britain. And in 1927, they were taken over by Morris. 
and the Morris Minor was already in existence way back in the late 1920s. They used the engine from that Morris Minor. I thought, I'll tell you what, we could make a sports car here. And it has the accolade that not many Jaguar fans might know of being, in effect, Sir William Lyons' first sports car. And it has a six-cylinder engine, the first of the six-cylinder Sir William Lyons cars. But it's a funny little engine. It's 1.3 litres, 1.3 litres, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, mine's one point... Uh, no, no, mine's about 900 cc's, because <laughs> it's... We discovered that on the way here, the head gasket between cylinders three and four has gone. So I'm working on 60% power at the moment. I can see why that car appeals to you, because... In the late 1920s, it was all about the expression of these small companies taking vehicles that were easy to come by, they were commonplace on the market, but adding an extra layer of design, an extra layer of customization. They were, in effect, the first customized cars. Yeah, I mean, we, th we think of cars um, as being very specifically allied to brands, you know, and the name is, is made by that firm. And of course, you know, in the 30s, they were all, so many of these small manufacturers were, were sharing not only components, they were sharing workforce. You know, people from uh, Feltham, Aston Martin were moonlighting at Marandaz's factory next door, you know. Uh, engines were being swapped. Uh, parts would, you know, would magically move over the road from one factory to another overnight. And, um, and so there was a huge amount of collaboration between the, the, the manufacturers in the early days. Um, by the way, thank you so much for telling me all about the history of my car, which I'd forgotten. <laughs> And um, that, um, but the, uh, the, the, the straight six is a beautiful, sweet engine, absolutely. And uh, the other thing you would remember also is I think at that time, you know, as, it, as is the case today, with different manufacturers sharing um, the same engine, the same platform, is that engine development is really expensive. So, and as it was then, so people would nick, borrow engines from Meadows or Continental in America or whatever, and, and just get hold of what they can and build cars around that. And this was a, this was Wolseley, yeah, developing that, a, a, what became actually a very successful sports car over the, the course of the 30s. And the other thing I'm very struck by is the fact that we, we now think of the car as being very much engineered by one firm. So. Um, you would buy a, 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 a modern Jaguar, for example. You know, so much of that is made in a supply chain which is belonging to Jaguar. It's kind of theirs. It's controlled by them. And in the 30s, even in the 50s and 60s, you know, you, you assembled cars from all kinds of supplies. You went to Alford and Brown or whatever, or you know, Salisbury Axle Company in Birmingham or whatever to get your bits. And you, and then you commissioned your chassis from a factory over there. And then you got your bodywork made over here. And that tradition still exists, or still, there's still an echo of that in Italian car manufacturing, because, uh, for example, in Alfa Romeo uh, and Ferrari and Maserati, there was a tradition right through the 60s and 70s of building chassis with engines and actually then farming out the bodywork and the trim to third party companies like Touring of Milan or Ghia or, or, or Zagato. Of course, for us, Ghia is a bit of badge engineering now, uh, as, as so much of those, those names are. But uh, it was happening in the UK. So that little Wolseley of mine um, actually has about five different incarnations according to which small bodyworks company working in canvas and plywood uh, rebodied it. And they were, they were sold very specifically by those companies as their versions of the Wolseley Hornet, you know. And there was a kind of cachet in buying that particular bodied car, you know. And it, it gets sanctioned, as it were, by the, by the Wolseley company. It's sad, really, that when you look at the history from that point on, that collaboration between all those small craftsmen turned into conglomeration, I guess, and BMC came along, and that was ultimately what caused us problems in the British motor industry, because when craftsmen work together, but in their individual styles, that's when the magic happens, really, and your car's an example of that, and the SS story is an example of that. Yeah, and it's not just, of, when we think of craftsmen, we think of people carving bits of wood, but we're, we should be talking about people standing underneath a, a 1930s turret mill, engineering crown wheels, you know, for their diffs. Um, or, 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 by the way, I did read recently how people are now rebuilding Spitfire aeroplanes in America, and just thanks to the tolerances of modern engineering standards on standard 
engineering machinery, they're able to achieve something like a 20 to 30 percent power increase from the Merlin engine because they were so rattly and loose and, you know, in the 30s, of course, built to uh, less demanding tolerances, you know, thanks mainly to the fact that the turret mills were themselves rather wobbly, you know, and everything was a little bit looser. So, in fact, if you look at if you look at historical vehicles, like old buildings, it's a miracle they're still there. And you begin to appreciate, actually, they are, are only still there, thanks to the eye and the judgment of the people operating those mills to know what was acceptable and what wasn't, what, what, what would work, what tolerance was appropriate, what wasn't. And, of course, even more remarkable that your car is there because, of course, it would have been quite old in relative terms as the Second World War dawned. And, of course, any old car that wasn't being used would have been melted down and turned into bits of spitfire. So anything really pre-war that exists, it's a real privilege to see it and an even bigger privilege to own. And, of course, next year, ladies and gentlemen, a bit of an exclusive for you here, we will be celebrating the anniversary of SS, Swallow Sidecars, and we'll be taking the Summer Jaguar Festival to Wappenbury Hall, the home of the man behind Jaguar, Sir William Lyons, and also a special tour to Blackpool as well to celebrate the very early beginnings of Jaguar. Uh, whether they were building on a Wolseley platform like your car, whether they were building on a uh, Austin 7 like the very first uh, Swallows, or of course the deal that was done with Sir John Black over at the Standard Motor Company later on uh, to build those cars on the standard chassis, what would then become of course the SS100 sports car, and then after the war, the Jaguar. As you look back on all of that era of cars, and as you look back on your own enjoyment of classic cars, um, what is it for you about older cars that sucks you in? Is it that connection with your dad? Is it the connection with the design? What is it that gets you up in the morning to go and work on the Wolseley in the, in the garage? I, I, I left home this morning. We left home at uh, quarter to seven to get here, to pick, to get the car, get it sorted, and drive here. And it took two hours from Bristol with stops, and that was pretty good. Um, and considering the last 20 miles were on 60% power, I was very pleased. We made it. And there is, and I've, I've been thinking about this over the last 24 hours, because last night I planned my route, right? <laughs> and, and we followed it. I memorized the road numbers to get here, because you can't look down from driving a car like that at your sat-nav or your, your phone and start fiddling, you know. It's two hands on the wheel all the way. And um, I, I tell you what I love about it, and, and it occurred to me on the way here today. In, it was spitting with rain. It was a grey sky. And I was driving down, uh, up past Sirencester. I think it was the A442. It's a beautiful straight Roman road. And I suddenly realised I had this massive grin on my face. And I was doing, I think at that point, 50 miles an hour. I, I, what I love about these cars is that you can sling them around country lanes. You can go around a roundabout and the back will kick out a bit. And, um, and when you, you change gear, you've got to double the clutch, you know, sometimes on the way up as well. And, and everything about the vehicles is mechanical and demands your attention. So I find myself looking at the little, little meter on the bonnet, you know, how hot is it? Look at the oil pressure, oil, oil temperature, ammeter, which is floating slightly below where it should be at the moment because it's got a vertical dynamo built in 1931. And all of these things add, if you like, they add the jeopardy, they add the sort of the tension because at any one point, if the, if the oil pressure drops too much, you know you've got a problem. Modern cars, they just don't have any of this. Um, gloriously, if you, if you want to drive a modern car, to get any thrill out of it, you've got to break the speed limit. You've got, to, you've got to endanger yourself and other people. I have no problem about endangering myself, but I, I don't want to be throwing stuff around lanes, you know, at stupid speeds. And what's glorious about old cars is, as you do so, as you're having enormous fun, this, you're enjoying the roar, the smell, the, the every sensory input that you can imagine. You're totally focused and engaged with this machine. There is no, there's no safety systems, there are no kind of remotes, there no, there's power assisted, nothing between you and the road. And you look down and you're doing 35 miles an hour. And that is sweet joy. Someone asked me last weekend, why do you do, I was doing a historic sporting trial, which is nutters like us go and take vintage cars and throw them up hillsides on an endurance trial. And someone asked me, you know, why, why would you do that? And, and my simple answer was, 
Life's busy. Uh, life's stressful. But when you're behind the wheel of a car like that, you can think of nothing else. It kind of cleanses the mind, doesn't it? Is, do you find you, the you same? You can't think about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it absolutely does. It's that distraction of, the, again, being totally in the zone. And if you pop out of it, start, you lose it. And the car's on the other side of the road or in a hedge. So you, it, it's totally focused and very, very, very demanding. And I, that, I, I find that the rigor of that, uh, of driving like that, and, I, and actually, in a sense, also pushing the car. So on a straight, trying to get it to 60, you know, trying to get it, uh, you know, gently coaxing it and coaxing yourself into, into as you get more and more comfortable with it. Um, all of that is is really it's it's hugely important, and it's the same in an E-Type, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's you know we we are insulated from the driving experience in modern cars, and and I suspect that so much of what we all connect to here is that the idea of contact. I'm glad I got you on driving because the very first series of Grand Designs, I was struck by this sort of designer character of Kevin McLeod who would turn up to these buildings being, being built in your TVR Tuscan, very, very flamboyant. Uh, these days, if it's an Astra, that's posh. What happened, Kevin? <laughs> well, the TVR wasn't mine. Ah, it okay. was TVRs. I love TVRs. They're, I call them reverse kit cars because you buy a complete <laughs> car and it slowly disassembles itself <laughs> in ownership. And um, I, so it, it was actually Peter Wheeler's car who you know, really? ran, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know this because I was stopped by the police in Vauxhall one night and they said, excuse me, sir. And I was, you know, in my 30s at that point, he says, we just noticed, sir, that this car is registered to Peter Wheeler. I said, really? I had no idea. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 they got it for the series. And, and um, now, I, I think some nerd counted the fact that I'd driven something like 63 different Vauxhalls <laughs> on Grand Designs, because they're not, I, I turn up, I get, I get the train, yeah, normally, and so I turn up in a taxi, and t for the driving shots, they give me their crew car, you know, the one that all the, the, they've been driving around in, clean it out, and so they rig it with cameras, and that's the one I drive to turn up. And for a brief, sweet moment, I mean, it was something like six months, we had a Jaguar I-Pace, which was exquisite, I love driving that. I drove it for three miles in six months. <laughs> Mainly... Usually it's something between 15 and 20 miles an hour, so I was just driving into some just drive, you know. And that was it. So it made the series, which was lovely. And it is a beautiful car, and it is the future, of course. And um, uh, now I drive everywhere in a camper van. Yes, of course, no hotels when you're No the hotels, yes. no trains, no planes, <laughs> no taxis, camper van. So uh, the camper van has yet to appear on screen. <laughs> Partly because I can't actually fit it into anybody's drive. Well, and if that, I did, it would block the house. Now you're living the life of those that build the houses, because usually they're in a static caravan and pregnant normally uh, at most points of the build. Um, I, I mean, there is a serious point behind that question, because I guess what I was getting to is you started with a very thirsty, flamboyant car. Obviously, your cars have got more sensible. Um, is that indicative of a responsibility that you feel for being ecologically aware, for being green, how do you reconcile that with owning old cars and promoting that sustainable way of life in the buildings that you're involved yeah, with? Yeah, there's one word that describes this and makes it easy for me, and that's hypocrisy. No. Um, look, the Federation, I've got to get it right, FHBVC? FBHVC. Oh, I can never get it right. You were very close. It's a five-letter acronym. How can anybody get a five-letter acronym right? The Federation of British Historical, Historical Vehicle, Vehicle Clubs. Club Owners People <laughs> say that I think something like, is it 2% of all cars on the road or registered on the road are historic? Yeah. And that, on the, by contrast, they, they actually contribute something like Three billion, or some ridiculous amount of money. Eight point six billion. How do you know this? Because I'm the communications director for the FBHVC. <laughs> then you don't need me here. So, well, I'm really struck by these figures, and and um, but actually, I'm most struck by the fact, and this is a, a FBHVC plea, really. He's got it now, and it's one I make about buildings, and I make it about cars, is that. Sustainability is about more than carbon. It's also about copper and concrete, about trees and fish, 
about water and it's about equitable fair trade. So it's about actually placing people in the planet in their rightful place and assuming that we can share our resources around, that we have enough to share with future generations. And when you start thinking about it in those terms, actually what we have uh, is of enormous value. And we, the idea of the throwaway society, of course, is something that we're coming to despise in so many aspects of our lives. And to have vehicles which represent the past, which um, may consume fuel, yes, but at the same time also have huge historic value. For me, they have a, an equivalent value, say, as an historic country house or a, an ancient mill, you know, because they show us where we've been. And we, don't, we cannot plot where we are going unless we know where we have been and what has been there along with us on the journey. So, yes, it's a good reason why we shouldn't be restoring what we own to the point where it actually seems new because it carries less of that historical value with it. Um, and I, 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 I seriously think that, um, that the, the value in what we collectively do with these machines adds extraordinary um, value to uh, training and engineering and apprenticeship skills. After all, that's what Vista Heritage is all about. Um, and by the same token, the objects themselves become tokens of that, of that emblematic strive of human beings to, you know, improve, change, alter, make things better. So I, I, I no, I, I, I don't see it at all as contradictory. I think it's actually, it's all part of the fuller definition of what sustainability is about. Ultimately, we can't keep making new things. We have to reuse things, and that's part of the argument as well. Um, for you, Kevin, uh, that's the future of uh, motoring sorted out. What about you? Is there more series in the can? What can we expect to see? <laughs> yes, uh, I have two arms, two legs still. And um, so, um, yeah, I hope so. I mean, because I've got no pension plan, so this is it. I've got to carry on till they shut me out. I, do you know what? And there's something else, too. I mean, I, I, so look, my dad retired at 60. He died at 73. Um, he retired at 60 because he saw all his fellow directors in his firm uh, retire at 65 and then at 66 they keeled over. And he thought, if I retire at 60, I've got five years of retirement. He had 13, which still wasn't enough. But I kind of think to myself, if I carry on, this is my theory, if I carry on till I'm 90, like David Attenborough, you know, if they'll have me, I'm, I, that, I can keep going in whatever capacity. And I think... Um, uh, it, that first of all, it's good, particularly I think for men who I think biologically are, are kind of stimulated by that. And the other thing is, I, I, when I go to work every morning, I'm usually in a foul mood when I arrive on location. I've battled through traffic. I've had to do my, I make my own bed. I've had to fill up with water. I've had to. I, I've had to cook my own breakfast and do my own washing up. It's not like staying in a hotel in a camper van. You've got to do everything. I've had to drive there, right? And I've got to be there by 7.30 or wherever it is. And um, anyway, as I get there, not in a good mood. And I nearly always leave at the end of the day not wanting to go. Boyed up, enthused, really excited, stimulated. It's not, I don't call it a job. It's not really a job what I do. It's more a privilege, it's a huge pleasure. And I get to see fantastic places and meet amazing people and feed off that energy, you know, and it's great. So as long as it's that way around and I don't end up at the end of the day completely knackered and fed up, I think, you know, that's the way it should be. And that's, that's uh, that, yeah, and uh, that should help me carry on a bit longer as well. Well, it's been a great pleasure and privilege to have you on here with us at the Summer Jaguar Festival. And I hope it's been a lovely day for you as well to uh, enjoy all of the Jaguars. We've got one job for you that we'd like you to do for us. We'd like you to go and have another wander around, Kevin, and come back to us at 2.30, where we'll be uh, presenting the Concours Awards on this stage and pick out your car of the show. But you've got other judges doing the proper judging. Yeah? It's going to be Kevin's car of the show. Yeah, but that could be that could be a clown car. It could be <laughs> could be anything. There's you no, like. I can't, I have I I bear no responsibility for that decision. I'll just choose something I really love. <laughs> could be anything, but I'm sure it will have taken ten years to build, just like <laughs> everything else. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round, please, for Thank Kevin. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.